Hello everyone and welcome to Edison TV. My name is Jyoti Prakash and I'm a healthcare analyst here at the Edison Group. We are joined today by Sten Sorensen, the CEO of Sereno Scientific, a clinical stage biotech developing innovative treatments for cardiovascular diseases. Welcome, Sten. Thank you. Pleasure. Let's start with your lead asset first, CS1, for which you have reported positive phase two data in PAH. Tell us more about the results and how significant are these for Sereno? Well, uh, we're very pleased with the results. Uh, we believe we are pioneering uh, the effort to untap uh, the potential in cardiovascular disease with epigenetic modulation through HDAC inhibition. We have two programs that we are pursuing that vision with. And the first program, CS1, uh, is in the rare disease pulmonary arterial hypertension. We have uh, uh, just uh, communicated our top line results from that trial, which we have pursued in collaboration with Abbott and their cutting edge technology, CardioMEMS, which is implanted in the patients. And we have pursued this trial in the US in 10 centers. So the uh, outcome of the top line, uh, it is a 2A trial and uh, we have uh, met our primary endpoint successfully. So safety and tolerability is met. And uh, we're very happy with that, of course. Uh, but also the trial has a secondary objectives to study experimental uh, outcomes and efficacy parameters. And uh, we're very happy with the compelling signs of efficacy that we believe we have seen here. And if I should go into um, to that specifically, uh, so uh, we have uh, the um, uh, safety data. We have no CS1, uh, so the, our compound is called CS1. We have no related serious adverse events, including hospitalization and mortality. We have no CS1 related changes in liver, liver lab values, and we have no related clinical significant platelets decrease or bleedings. So safety is clear. Uh, in addition, we had good tolerability in the trial. When it comes to the uh, efficacy parameters, so what physicians want to achieve in these patients, which is a, it's a deadly disease, pulmonary arterial hypertension. You have, without therapy, two and a half years to live after diagnosis. Uh, in the past, that was the case. With all therapeutics, available today and the physician care, you have a mean uh, average life expectancy of seven and a half years. Now, uh, uh, what physicians want to do is has me, 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 two object, key uh, clinical objectives. One is to reduce the risk of, of, uh, of death. Uh, and that's uh, uh, measured through uh, the reveal risk score tool that physicians are using, which is a, a, in a, a, there are different tools, but around 20 parameters that are measured in the patients. And it's well documented that if you can affect risk score, you will have an impact on survival. Uh, the second thing that you want to achieve as a physician is improve quality of life in these patients. And that's um, uh, physical capacity, I would say, as a key measurement. And, and that is, you can document through functional class and impact on functional class. So functional class has four levels. Uh, the first class is uh, you have a diagnosis without symptoms. And uh, the, the fourth class is you're bedridden. You can't leave your bed. So you're that affected. And then there are two classes, functional class two and three in between. So what you'd like to do as a physician is to keep these patients not deteriorate in the risk and not deteriorate in the functional class if you can with drugs. And then uh, as an optimal objective, maybe improve their risk score and their functional class. And what we have seen in our trial is that 43% of our patients improved the risk score. Nine out of 21 patients were improved. Uh, and uh, 15 out of 21 patients 
were improved or stable in the risk score. And this is important. So those who improved uh, are improved uh, determined as one, one score. What does that mean? So if you improve one score point in patients uh, in these 12 weeks that the study uh, was um, ongoing with therapy, you have improved uh, the survival uh, possibility for these patients with 23%. And, so, and th this was achieved in nine out of 21 patients in our study. If we move on to functional class, we have seven out of 21 patients or 33% improved their functional class. And that means that they have moved from a more severe class to a lighter functional class. So um, we had in, in these circumstances, the seven, there were five patients that moved from functional class three and, and to two, and two patients moving from functional class two to one, so not feeling the disease really. So we have actually obtained uh, the clinician's goal here in this uh, study in quite some number of patients, uh, reducing risk score and improving functional class. Now let's then also look at what we saw when it comes to hemodynamics. So we utilized CardioMEMS, uh, which is Abbott's technology. It's an implantable device, so you can measure pulmonary pressure every day in these patients uh, wirelessly. And what we saw over this short period of time, the, the study is 12 weeks. Normally studies are six months or longer. Um, but in this study, we saw that two thirds of the patients, 14 out of 21, had a sustained pressure reduction uh, at the end of the trial. And the CardioMEMS can measure the, the load, so the days uh, multiple by the, uh, the, the decrease in the pulmonary pressure. And, and we, thus we've had impact on risk score, functional class, and the uh, hemodynamic parameter pulmonary, mean pulmonary pressure as measured with CardioMEMS area under the curve uh, measurement. So that's the overview of the data, safety and tolerance met, and these uh, very encouraging, uh, I would say, uh, uh, experimental efficacy data. Now, what we also have done is that we have done an in-depth analysis uh, of the trial in relation to high responders. And we have, what you want to do really, and we are, our vision is to impact the root cause of the disease. So impacting the actually the vessel. So what happens in these patients is that there is a pathological remodeling uh, going on, which uh, um, decreases the lumen in the pulmonary artery, and it makes it also less uh, flexible. So the compliance it's called goes down. And what happens then is that the right ventricle needs to pump, has to pump through a, a more narrow lumen in the pulmonary artery, which then puts pressure on the right heart and increases the pressure in the artery. And eventually the, this, these patients die of right heart failure. And what you want to do compared to the drugs that have been used and are used here historically, which are vasodilators, so they dilate the pulmonary arteries, what you want to do really is you would love to prevent further deterioration in the pathological remodeling, uh, so stop the progression of the disease and ideally reverse the pathological remodeling, so make the vessels more compliant and the lumen larger and, and release the pre uh, reduce the pressure on the right heart. And how can you do that? Well, we have seen in preclinical studies that our active ingredient VPA, the HDAC inhibitor, is an anti-inflammatory. It is an antifibrotic. It has documented uh, prevention and uh, also reverse remodeling in both heart and, and vessels. And it's also documented to be an antithrombotic, which happens in these patients microthrombosis. So we have already seen with our active ingredient in models of animal models in PH that we can prevent 
the remodeling and we can also reverse it and we can also has also seen that we can reduce pressure interestingly uh, so that's the platform for why we're pursuing uh, this in ph but also why we're pursuing uh, hdac inhibition in cardiovascular disease so our second program we released data uh, the week before the top line that we have documented in animal work here again uh, that our HDAC inhibitor, our novel HDAC inhibitor CSO14 has a dose dependent reduction on pathological remodeling as measured uh, through fibrosis, so reduced fibrosis and importantly plexiform lesions. So this is what happens really on a histolo histology level in these patients. And we believe that that impact will translate then into functional and risk score reduction, and especially into pulmonary vascular resistance reduction. And we have then gone into our clinical trial with CS1, uh, this uh, phase two trial, and looked at pul pulmonary vascular resistance in the high responders. And what we have seen there is that almost 25% or so five out of the 21 patients have a PVR reduction between 35% to 51% with a mean of 45% reduction. And we believe that that relates to the impact on a histology, histology level on plexiform lesions and, and uh, uh, hypertrophy reduction. So uh, we have also seen in these high responders that we have a corresponding uh, improvement in uh, stroke volume. So the heart in these patients can pump better and then oxygenate the, uh, these patients better, uh, probably uh, relating to an increased cardiac output then. And that would then correspond to an increased physical capacity. Now, the material is small. Uh, but we still believe that uh, we have something really interesting here in the HDAC inhibitor uh, mode of action. Um, so uh, this is, uh, I think we have, the, this data really shows a consistent uh, in the clinic here with what we have seen with VPA and our novel CSO14 HDAC inhibitor. And that is encouraging for the future, I think. So a long answer to you, a short question. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the detailed answer. And yes, exciting data indeed. You mentioned that uh, the phase two trial was a 12-week study, but you're also running an expanded access program and recently dosed your first patient. How's that going? And uh, what are the next steps for the CS1 program? Yeah, uh, thanks for bringing that up. I mean, we are, so I think uh, just a reflection on last year. So we got a report from an investigator of a remarkable patient improvement case, which we also communicated about. So we had a patient diagnosed three years earlier that uh, when uh, remembering now that, that this study is on, uh, our drug is given to the patients on top of a standard of care. And so within, after these 12 weeks, that patient improved and moved from functional class two to one, basically asymptomatic. She also had a 43% reduction in PVR and a normalization of cardiac output. So that was the first clinical information that we got from this HDAC inhibitor uh, pioneering effort. Then uh, we did a readout in the, in the fall uh, in CardioMEMS, and we saw a, a similar uh, number of impacts. So about two thirds of the patients had a reduction of AUC, uh, which was also encouraging. And then at the end of the year, we were approached by other investigators asking us to please submit a compassionate use or expanded access application to the FDA so they could keep the drug on their patient, which we did and which was approved uh, the 30th of January this year. So it's taken some time uh, from a regulatory perspective to get this then approved on e in each uh, site, clinical site. So it's, it is a protocol uh, uh, that is uh, approved by FDA. Uh, so this compassionate use or expanded access program uh, will be run on, on the protocol. 
at, uh, at the sites where there are patients uh, and physicians who want to pursue this expanded access program. And we just, as you mentioned, communicated that we have our first patient dosed in, in compassionate use. And this um, uh, compassionate use will continue for a year or longer in each patient that want to do it. Uh, we hope to be able to provide a longer term treatment, but a year minimum. Um, and we expect, we have gotten reports back that maybe around 10 patients will be included in this program. And by that, we of course will be able to see what happens clinically over long term. Uh, and interestingly here, these patients have um, the CardioMEMS implantable technology implanted for life. So we will be able to measure with that technology in these patients. And in addition, we also communicated here uh, Monday this week that we have signed a collaboration, a partnership with Fluida, the company Fluida, who has another cutting edge technology that you can visualize the impact on pulmonary vessels by uh, drug therapy. So we will have, uh, uh, we hope, uh, a fair amount of our patients from the Compassionate Use Program will be uh, uh, included in the Fluida Partnership Measurement uh, uh, approach. So we will not only be able to, uh, to study clinical uh, and safety parameters, but also uh, be able to study this with uh, CardioMEMS and with the Fluida technology. It's a CT scan technology that you can visualize the impact on the pulmonary arteries. So very happy about that. And we hope that we can uh, get some information out of that uh, compassionate use program uh, in sometime during the spring, uh, first half of, of next year. So that will add to the pool of information that we are getting out of this phase 2A trial. Uh, and we'll, uh, we believe will be helpful in our discussions with the FDA about the, the next programs moving forward with CS1. Great, great to see you leveraging medical technology in your trials and we look forward to more information there. Uh, moving on to our next question, and this is on CSO 14, your second program, which, is, which has entered the clinic this year as well. And it's also an HTAC inhibitor. Uh, can you share more details about this program and how it's progressing? Yeah, uh, of course. You know, we are excited about the second program uh, in H with HDAC inhibition into cardiovascular disease. And I would say the real vision here is to untap the potential of epigenetic modulation utilizing HDAC inhibition. The first program is based on an existing molecule that's been in man for around 60 years and it's been used for epilepsy prevention so an asymptomatic uh, disease um, uh, to prevent epilepsy uh, the that drug has we have taken into cs1 and as we can see from this study in in our phase two trial here is that the effective dose in ph seems to be one tenth uh, around one tenth to uh, one fifth of what's used for epilepsy prevention, which is very encouraging uh, for us. Um, so, but what we did uh, was when we realized the potential that it exists here for patients uh, um, to utilize this mode of action, we embarked on a new molecule. Uh, and this was because we found over 500 articles with proof of concept and other types of data in various cardiovascular indications, mostly of course in lab or uh, animal work. Um, but there's also epidemiological data uh, showing uh, very interesting information in relation to less um, MI or less stroke incidence in those who've utilized uh, HDAC inhibitors to prevent epilepsy. But anyway, so we, we believe there's a great potential here and we were approached by a group at Astra in a small uh, biotech group that suggested to us to uh, produce a new molecule uh, uh, 
uh, instead of uh, uh, as an addition to what we're doing with CS1 that would improve the profile of that compound and that's CSO14. These uh, chemists and doctors were behind the follow-up compounds of once the largest drug on the market, Losec or Omeprazole. So Nexium is their uh, work and they are behind many other drugs at Astra. So they came with this idea to us and we bought that idea and, and acquired that idea and that's CSO14. So it's an analog, if you will, of EPA that has a better profile. And uh, we have very interesting data in thrombosis prevention. So that's how the company was originally established that you could um, improve the defense mechanism that we have as humans uh, against thrombosis. We, and that is a protein that we have in our, stored in the endothelial cell walls, which is very scarce in risk patients for thrombosis, such as obese, PMI, diabetics, etc., hypertensives. So if you could give a drug to these patients that would improve the, the uh, defense mechanism, increase the synthesis, storage and release capacity of TPA, you would, we believe, uh, have a chance to prevent thrombosis here, like the body is doing itself, but these patients will lower the risk for thrombosis. And we would be able to do so without increasing bleeding risk 24 seven, which is a, a very large, significant need on the market. So three out of 100 patients today die of their medication, uh, uh, prevention medications due to bleedings. And 25 out of 100 has some kind of bleeding. And many of them need to uh, uh, go to the hospital to stop it. So there is a need for a, a drug that doesn't cause bleeding risk. And we have seen in our preclinical work, very translatable to man, um, cremaster models in mice, that we can prevent effectively thrombosis without causing bleeding risk. So CSO14 has has been developed with that purpose uh, and uh, we are now in phase one with that a, a dose escalation and we will have that study in phase one completed we believe by the end of the spring so uh, in q2 some some time and then that drug will be ready for phase two we're very excited about that program too sounds good uh, so you have two assets in the clinic now and we all know that running clinical programs is a capital intensive exercise. Um, you have previously mentioned being open to M&A, out licensing or co-development for your programs. Are you actively seeking partnerships in any of these areas? Yes, um, uh, uh, we have, we are. I mean, we have not actively pursued that for, you know, pre COVID and, and, you know, until COVID was over and then uh, actually waited for our, uh, to have a more substance uh, around our pioneering effort. Uh, so get some information out of uh, the HDAC inhibition in, uh, you know, how it's working in man. So before we've had uh, preclinical information, but last year that changed. So with the remarkable patient case, with the readout in the fall of cardium M's and uh, uh, MPAP reductions, the request for compassionate use by investigators want, don't wanting to let go of the drug. And then of course now our top line results, which show that the drug is safe uh, and it's well tolerated. It doesn't have uh, many of the risks that the other drugs have on the market. It's an oral uh, tablet that can be given probably to most of the patients today out there. And it looks to have an impact on uh, preventing or reversing the pathological remodeling that's taking place in the pulmonary arteries. So it's getting much more interesting now to talk to potential partners or uh, acquirers of our portfolio. So uh, we are in some talks, um, early days, I would say, but, um, but the, the interest is going up. So it looks like uh, you have an active period ahead. Uh, so for our investors, what could be some of the key events or milestones 
that they can look forward to in the next 12 to 18 months? Yeah, it's uh, uh, you know it's it's very active uh, and it's it's both fun and exciting. Uh, our team is working hard and and our partners. Uh, so yeah, so I think the first uh, thing that will happen more communicative is um, after this interview is a Capital Markets Day that we will be holding on the 17th of October, uh, which will be webcast and we will spend three hours together uh, on our programs and uh, our plans. Uh, but then more uh, technically maybe we will complete the analysis and the study report uh, on the top line uh, or on the phase 2A program and then we'll initiate our discussions with regulatory authorities uh, uh, around the future programs. We hope and believe that we'll be able to do a phase 2B3 trial, so a combined pivotal trial to bring this uh, novel agent to patients. And we, we have previously communicated that our objective is to do so by 2029, if not faster. Now, so that's uh, one target. The second target here is, of course, to get information out of the Compassionate Use Program, the more clinical information. And we hope to include more patients soon in that program and have some readout in, in the first half of the year. And in addition, also then read out on the pulmonary artery remodeling with the Fluida technology. The other milestone that I have mentioned is that our second HDAC program, CSO 14, will complete its phase one trial uh, by the end of the first half of next year. So we will then uh, hopefully have data that this is safe and well tolerated in uh, healthy volunteers. And we will meanwhile define our programs to be brought into phase two with that compound. I should say that we have a third uh, project in drug development, which is a novel prostacycline receptor agonist, CS585. We have acquired that or I would say license the right fully from University of Michigan. We've had a collaboration effort with University of Michigan for four years now, approximately. And we're working very much with Professor Michael Hollinstadt there, who is a star in the blood field. Uh, and he has done the CREMASTER models on both agents, CSO14 and CS585. The work around CS585 was published in the peer review top end journal Blood last fall. So about and, and CS585 is, is very interesting. So it's based on an endogenic lipid of which which has been discovered by Mike Hollinstadt and, and well documented to be very specific and very potent to the IP receptor. And uh, the molecule CS585 is based on this discovery. And it has since been documented that it is a long acting agent and that it prevents thrombosis without causing bleeding risk. So Blood made an editorial, published the work and also made a podcast where they highlighted gain with no pain, i.e a new strategy for prevention of thrombosis without causing bleeding risk, question mark. So I think that this uh, drug development is very exciting. It will, uh, has been presented at several conferences this year and will be presented more information at the American Heart coming up in November. It was also presented at EEC. So we are, uh, haven't defined the target indication for that drug, uh, but we hope to do so in not too distant future and maybe specify also more around CSO 14's target indication, which is quite wide at the moment, uh, just thrombosis. Uh, so that is some information that shareholders can look forward to also uh, receiving. That's great. Uh, thanks a lot, Stan, for this insightful discussion. Uh, we look forward to more updates on your ongoing programs in the future. For our audience wanting to learn more about Sereno Scientific, please refer to edisongroup.com. Thank you.